really forced us to uh, come together and work as a collaborative team. Um, some of it, some of these original collaborators were on my original proposal, and some of them were suggested by you guys. And for me, as a researcher, it was kind of a very unique experience to all of a sudden be thrown into a pot to work with one another. But I think it's been incredibly successful, and I want to thank you for sort of making me sometimes go outside my comfort zone. And, and really being able to investigate things from a diverse team, and I think that, that's very important. Um, obviously, it's multi-state. Um, we're working with uh, people in academia and government agencies from Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Florida. So that's important when we talk about environmental factors. Um, we really want to understand this host pathogen, plant pathogen interaction. And a lot of times when we get focused in our own environment, taking into account environmental factors um, sometimes becomes very closed. And so being able to have a multi-state project of, of this magnitude um, hopefully will allow us to incorporate those environmental conditions into this. So most of our research is really focused on using a systems biology approach. So we're looking at the genes, the proteins, and then we're taking it one step further and we're looking at um, the metabolomics. Uh, so we're really trying to get a whole sense um, and a complete picture to understand the complex host pathogen interaction between this fungus and the plant cell. And then our ultimate goal is to really identify gene-based uh, resistance markers, uh, working in conjunction with uh, USDA ARS uh, corn host resistant unit, uh, led by Paul Williams and uh, Dr. Marilyn Warburton, to take these molecular markers and really help aid in um, plant breeding programs where we can hopefully uh, breed traits uh, that are not only resistant to aflatoxin and fungal uh, accumulation, but to also have economically viable crops, uh, things that are what we typically like to see from our corn. Some of our original corn breeding studies, you know, when every kernel is individually husked, that it becomes a nightmare uh, when you're on the farm, you know, trying to peel each individual husk off. Although it was great at preventing aflatoxin accumulation and fungal uh, infestation. It wasn't really viable um, as an agricultural economy. So we had three main objectives. Um, our first main objectives was really to identify these candidate genes uh, for our gene-based markers for resistance um, so that we could ultimately develop uh, resistant corn hybrids. And then to really gather a snapshot um, of the response of the corn uh, germplasm lines, the varying levels, so we're looking at multiple uh, varieties for resistance and susceptibility uh, to aflatoxin accumulation, um, and also look at the incorporation with following inoculation with toxigenic strains and non-toxigenic strains, so that we can really look at not only the corn's response to fungal infection, but also corn response to fungal infection and the production of the toxin itself. This is really important when we're talking about biological control agents and how do they work and how do they affect the corn and what's that relationship. And then ultimately, to take this whole picture and really apply it back to various environmental conditions. Again, so that we can gather all the possible information and really put together um, a concrete picture of what's going on comprehensive diagram of that complex host pathogen interaction. So year one, um, we had, we planted six maize lines, well, I should say we planted more maize lines. We had success uh, with six maize lines. Uh, they were inoculated um, with toxigenic and uh, non-toxigenic strains of A. Um, and we used water as well. So we can look at the incorporation and the effect that the fungus has on the corn, um, in addition to just wound response 
uh, would be, so that we can really look at those differences um, in the genes, the proteins, and uh, the metabolites. Um, we used a single kernel inoculation technique. Uh, this was developed um, by Dr. Paul Williams' group. Um, and this is uh, my graduate student, uh, Cedric Reed. Um, he was out in the field uh, with a couple of other students, individually hand inoculating several kernels uh, on multiple lines of corn and multiple rows. It was incredibly painstaking, but I think it will prove to be incredibly effective as we go through the data. Um, some of these lines, uh, we planted uh, VA35, uh, which is a susceptible line. Um, we also planted um, MP7, MP719 um, and MP315D. These are resistant lines, and these are also lines that have been um, what we consider good donor lines um, in the resistance community for plant breeding. So these kernel samples that were both inoculated and uninoculated, uh, we collected them, we harvest them, at day one, day three, day seven, day 14, and day uh, 21 after inoculation. Um, and then samples were flash frozen to retain the integrity of the nucleic acids and the other small molecules so that we could then um, send them to the various labs that we're working with so that we could all work on our sort of little niche and then come back and, and uh, provide all the information so that we could really go through and analyze uh, this complex data set. So one of the things that we know what we've inoculated. So we know that we've inoculated with um, a non-toxigenic strain. We've marked it down, we've written it down, we know what kernels we've inoculated. Um, but we have to prove it to ourselves. We have to make sure that we can identify which strain is actually there and then how much of that strain is actually present uh, within those individual kernels. So we're using uh, quantitative real-time PCR uh, along with strain-specific uh, molecular markers. And we've really then begun to go through um, these kernels that were collected and assess the aflavus uh, biomass. And so with these primers, um, we're hoping then to quantify the amounts of each fungal strain within these inoculated mixes. Uh, we've also developed a single kernel aflatoxin uh, analysis uh, method, which obviously if we're using single kernels for our genomics, for our proteomics, for our metabolomics, um, and we're able to um, identify how much fungal biomass is there, we then also need to take those kernels and be able to identify um, the amount of aflatoxin that's present. So in working in conjunction with Agilent Technologies and part of your funding really help solidify this. It's always nice to go to an instrument company and say there's support for this work. Um, we've formed a partnership and I'll present some of that, some of the partnership work a little bit later when we talk about leveraging. Um, but we were, they donated um, a $500,000 piece of equipment uh, to us to begin to really go through and, and help validate this single kernel asset. And so what we can see um, from our initial studies um, looking at um, VA35, uh, which is the susceptible line, then we see a dramatic increase in the amount of um, aflatoxin um, that's, that's present. Um, it really starts to pick up after about 14 days uh, through, 20, through 21 days. We're now going back and analyzing the data from the one in three days. Um, whereas if we look at MP719, even though it, it also has uh, some aflatoxin, it remains relatively constant. So, for those of you that work with genes and proteins, I'm a biochemist, first of all, so genes are great, but for me, genes can sometimes lie to you. Just because they're turned on and they're expressing doesn't mean that the proteins the biochemists that are doing all of the work are actually functioning properly. So, um, and if those proteins are functioning proper, properly, what are they producing? Those are really um, the metabolomics aspect of it. So in conjunction, we looked at volatile metabolites um, that were being 
produced um, from the toxin, or I'm sorry, from the fungus. And what we were able to see is that if we looked at 21882 uh, versus 3357, 21882 is a non toxigenic strain, and 3357 um, is a toxigenic strain, uh, that we saw this unique analyte. Um, although it was present in both, we saw an increase in the concentration of the analyte um, as we progressed uh, through time. We were also able then to identify that this analyte um, seemed to increase with the production of aflatoxin. Um, so one of the things that, that we're additionally working on is, wouldn't it be great if we could use this volatile profile um, this volatile analyte to then be able to detect and to somehow correlate it to the amount of aflatoxin that's present. Um, this would be a great application with um, grain cars or grain elevators to really then be able to go through and say, you know, we can take an air sample instead of just simply dipping in and pulling out because if you've got the aflatoxin here and the fungus here and you sample over here, you're not then going to get a complete representation of how much toxin and how much fungus is there. I don't know what this analyte is. I'd love to tell you I do. I'm working on it. Um, I have an idea of what it is, but just simply using GCMS, I don't have enough, it doesn't tell me enough about it. So again, um, partnering with Agilent Technologies, we're using GCQTOF, uh, which is a phenomenal tool. Um, and we're actually able to do exact maps and get a lot more information about this. So right now we're going through and we're looking at uh, the volatile profiles of, of these individual um, fungus strains and then being able to identify uh, exactly what this, this analyte is. The great thing about knowing what you have is then you can really fine tune your analytical techniques uh, to really make them incredibly sensitive. Uh, continuing along the lines with the metabolomics, um, working in conjunction with um, Eric Schmeltz and uh, Alyssa from uh, Florida at the USDA ARS office, um, they're interested in looking at phytolexins, and specifically phytolexins that are associated with aflatoxin uh, accumulation. And they're using a lot of the same analytical tools um, that I use, so they're using vapor pressure extraction uh, GC, chromatography, chemical ionization, mass spectrometry to really go through and be able to identify these very small phytolexins um, that are being produced in response to fungal contamination. Um, and coupling that with the individual kernel uh, aflatoxin accumulation data, hopefully we'll be able to re re relate these phytolexins back to aflatoxin accumulation and fungal infection. So we're hoping that this will prove to be useful in the consideration of really corresponding these gene candidates. If we know what it makes, we can go back, we can look at the proteins, um, and we can look at the genes. So we're sort of approaching it from, two, from both ends, looking at the metabolites, looking at the proteins, looking at the genes, looking at the genes, looking at the proteins, and looking at the metabolites. Um, we also, this work um, is in press right now. Um, in the Journal of Proteomics. So we constructed a two-dimensional proteome reference map for aflatoxigenic A-flavus 3357. Uh, we used 2D gel electrophoresis coupled with uh, Multitoff MS. Uh, and we were able to identify approximately 536 mycelial proteins. Um, and most of these were functionally annotated to cellular metabolic metabolic processes, um, which you would expect. Uh, but we were also able to identify a few enzymes from the aflatoxin <coughs> uh, synthesis pathway. Um, this is just a little bit more of the data that was presented in this paper. Um, using uh, gene ontology, uh, we were able to link approximately 85.5% of the proteins to molecular function, uh, 76 uh, percent of the proteins were annotated to biological processes, and 32 percent of these um, proteins were annotated to cellular. So within the proteomics, um, so I've talked a little bit about um, so 
some of the small molecule work, some of the analytical tools that we've developed. But now we're looking at, so we're sort of working backwards, what proteins are involved. And so we're really using um, expression profiling. And so this right here, this is a uh, two-dimensional gel. Um, and it's showing the, the image of profiling protein expression levels, which are develop, developing of kernels of MP715, uh, 14 days after inoculation. And so we were able then to compare the protein expression levels uh, between the susceptible and the resistant corn lines. And we were able to reveal differentially expressed proteins and then relate them back to resistance. We took this one step further. Uh, and this work is actually done by Xuan Chan and Don Murphy. Um, and so we were actually able to use 3D, mo 3D modeling. And so as a, a biochemist, this is really very cool for me. Um, you know, one of the things is, is that even if you have slight mutations, is the three-dimensional structure different? Um, I preach to my biochemistry class all the time that it's, it's the three-dimensional structure of our proteins that dictates function. And so just because you have mutations, are those mutations significant enough to change sort of the three-dimensional structure? And so this is just a, one small excerpt of, of, of some of their work. Um, and so this is, this is a maize RNA binding protein. Um, and what they found was that there's this observed uh, glycine-rich part. Um, and it seems to be different um, within the amino acids within this glycine-rich region between the susceptible and the resistant lines. However, when we did the modeling, the three-dimensional structure is, is very similar. So these results demonstrate really that this comparative modeling can be in, employed for structural and functional differences between resistant and susceptible varieties. Of course, um, Dr. Shan wanted me to put the little exclaimer in at the bottom. Further study is required for verification of the results. Uh, but it does look very promising. So moving on now to genomics and transcriptomics. Uh, we're using, again, real-time PCR to, quant to uh, identify differentially expressed genes um, so that we can basically use these genes then within this um, pipeline for molecular marker design. Uh, and so here we're, um, we're presenting data for, um, for a gene, uh, L LCAT, lactin cholesterol, uh, tran acyl trans transferase, um, and we can see that they're differentially expressed between uh, the resistant and the susceptible lines. Um, right now, our RNA sequencing, the preparation is underway, um, and so what we're hoping to do is that this will allow us to gather gene expression, couple this with our biomass data, with our toxin accumulation data, um, with our metabolomics data, with our proteomics data from individual kernels that have all been inoculated, comparing them with the uninoculated, and then really gather this um, comprehensive picture to fully understand post-pathogen interaction. And then to better correlate gene expression with toxin accumulation and follow up So the ultimate goal really is to aid in, in plant breeding. Um, and so to take these candidate genes that we've identified from the systems biology approach um, and then submit them uh, for sequencing and mapping within the pipeline, um, within the corn host plant resistant unit, uh, to design DNA markers and then test in the molecular assisted uh, breeding applications program. So that's our ultimate. Uh, we had several exciting outputs. Uh, this funding went to support two graduate students. Uh, we were able to present work at four different uh, conferences, which is always exciting. Um, Alka uh, is a graduate student who works on this, on this work. Uh, she actually presented at the Corn Utilization and Technology Conference in Indianapolis and won an award for her, for, um, for her presentation. Um, our collaborative team, we had three publications uh, come out 
in conjunction with some other funding that we have, but also with funding from this. Uh, so our two-dimensional proteome reference map, um, which I talked about earlier. Um, we did a fermentation of aflatoxin in inoculated corn study, um, and that was published in Natural Resources. And then uh, molecular characterization uh, using uh, single nucleotide poly polymorphic uh, markers, and that's in uh, genomics. Leveraging, leveraging is always important um, when you come back and, and talk. What, what can we do with basically getting these preliminary results and how can we uh, get more funding? Um, so we, we applied for four grants um, last year uh, with, based on taking uh, the preliminary data that we got from year one. Um, this first one uh, from the FDA is really unique. I have a joint appointment show, so I'm a professor in the biochemistry uh, department. I'll leave it at that when our name is now about this long. So the merge departments, it's kind of like the title of my talk. So, But I'm in the biochemistry department. But I also have a directorship in the regulatory lab, so within the state chem lab itself. Um, and so we put forth an accreditation proposal uh, where we're looking to accredit the lab under ISO 17025 standards, which really then allows us to be able to become an emergency response laboratory um, and use the same quality control measures uh, that are, are used in any lab. There's 36 state labs uh, that receive funding for this. And what's really neat about this is that year two, one of the things that we're trying to really do is um, improve our testing capabilities uh, for aflatoxin and other mycotoxin um, methods, testing methods uh, for the state of Mississippi. Um, I talked about our partnership. Um, so we're monitoring fungal contamination. Um, Agilent Technologies donated an FTIR, a portable FTIR system. Um, in which we're looking at being able to use uh, this portable system in a biological control environment to be able to differentiate uh, between toxic and uh, non-toxigenic strains of, of A. flavus. Um, we're also looking at soybean pathogens and a variety of other pathogens using that technique. And then our, our LCMS um, instrument that we are running. We've applied for two uh, USDA grants. Uh, one of them is a conference grant, so um, if I get it, I'll probably be sending a lot of you an email because I'd like for you guys to come and, and present and hear some of the, the work that's going on there. Um, and so our oh, timeline... Could you talk about that last one you had up there? So this one, uh, this one, the mitigation transfer of aflatoxin into milk um, using mycotoxin absorbance. This is in conjunction with our animal uh, and dairy science department. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is taking some of these clays um, and instead of just putting them in the feed itself, can we use this as a way to absorb um, the aflatoxin out of contaminated milk and contaminated milk products? And then, so our timeline and our milestones uh, for year two. Obviously, we're going to continue with our systems biology approach. So we're going to look at genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics studies. Uh, we're going to continue to analyze year one data. Um, we're going to hopefully come up with some candidate genes uh, for Dr. Warburton's uh, gene pipeline for her um, molecular, molecular marker program. And then we're going to have year two field studies again. Um, and hopefully this year be able to plant these same test spots in other locations, Louisiana, and Florida, and Georgia specifically. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank you. Dr. Brown, is there any questions? I've got a quick question. Uh, as far as, you know, I think you'll have a huge number of candidate genes. That's a, there's going to be a lot of data that comes out of this project. I was just wondering your thoughts on maybe prioritizing candidates or, you know, if you, if you get to the point where there's, there's too many interesting things to look at, how will your group tackle that, that sort of issue? Yeah, that's um, Marilyn's expertise. Um, and so she's going through 
the, the first thing is one, identifying them, and then really looking at a lot of the things that we identify, if, it would be great if we could find something within those gene pathways that we know are related to um, some type of fungal infection or uh, <coughs> the toxin. So that's going to be our first, our, our, our first thing. Um, I was intrigued uh, by your uh, <coughs> biomass toxin comparisons, and I realized why you're doing this for how many days. But in the field, as corn dries down, the aflatoxin levels right. rise, and it might be informative to look at biomass and toxin and all that. We are. We are as well. Um, I didn't show that here, but we are. We're looking at it. Um, we've got a graduate student that that is her project, and so she's looking at, you know, as we dry it, as we store it, uh, humidity conditions and things like that. One of one of our compounds, how many of them are produced for fungi, how many of them are produced by corn? Yes. So um, there's a ton, and that's really. <coughs> the, the data that I showed there with um, with the, the GCMS data, um, those were grown on media, and then we subtracted the media out of it. Um, the media is a corn cracked slurry media, so it is grown on corn. Um, and so we have a tendency to sort of just subtract as a baseline things that come from, from that media itself. But that is a problem. Um, if you know what you're looking for, um, then you can sort of get rid of all the rest of it. When you're just sort of looking at these giant profiles, it's, it becomes like sometimes like looking at a needle on a haystack. Uh, so one more question. Because I want to start in that system. So which protein will answer your center will be the most sensitive to alpha? If I uh, assume the corn will respond to alpha toxin too, right? Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, which protein I should look for, I think it's the most sensitive one in response to alpha toxin presence. I, I wish I had that answer. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a single protein. I'd be really surprised. It would make my life a lot easier and a lot of other people's lives a lot easier if it was a single protein. Corn is way too complex for that. Fungal interaction is going to be way too complex for that and then the fungus itself. So. It's going to be, you know, just sort of sifting through the data and, and being able to decide them. That's what gives us all a job, right? If it was easy, you know, we'd have to answer other questions. So. <laughs>